Nelson Mandela once said, If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. We can take this one of two ways. Maybe Mandela is saying that making the effort to learn one's language is a high form of respect for one's culture, a claim I think most people would agree with. However, he could be suggesting that speaking in someone's native language clicks with them in a way that a learned language just doesn't. Beyond mere comprehension, they would connect with the content in some more profound way. Still, many, if even fewer, people would agree with this. Charlemagne said, To speak another language is to have another soul. The essence of this quote is much clearer. He contends that there is something very special about knowing a second language, but beyond that, he's suggesting that a second language grants someone a new identity. Of course, he's not speaking literally, but his argument quite literally is that knowing a second language provides that person with an entirely new worldview. Is it true that one's language affects their worldview? Whether it be Mandela's heart quote or Charlemagne's soul quote, both speak to a controversy within linguistics called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. In short, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, also known as linguistic relativity, posits that language affects worldview. That is, people's perspectives on the world are relative to their native language. The hypothesis usually takes one of two forms. The first is linguistic determinism, strong Whorfianism, or some related term. It contends that one's language not only affects, but also determines one's thought by imposing conceptual limits and structure. It is largely rejected by modern linguistics due to its simplification and arguably its essentialism. The second is weak Whorfianism, which holds that one's language influences one's thought patterns but does not completely determine it. Just how much influence it has is hotly debated in linguistic circles. Either way, each of these versions of the theory supposes that language affects thought. Maybe the most common vestige of Whorfianism is the claim that the Hopi indigenous people of North America have no concept of time. You may even have heard of this. The claim originated from none other than Benjamin Lee Whorf, who, fun fact, has a linguistic theory named after him. In the 1940s, he wrote that the Hopi language has, quote, no words, grammatical forms, construction, or expressions that refer directly to what we call time, end quote. Because he was a linguistic relativist, he took this to believe that the Hopi had no concept of time, at least one comparable to ours. Worf developed the following maxim. Because the Hopi language lacks grammatical structures referring to time, the Hopi people must not have a concept of time. More broadly, this deterministic proof can be presented as if language A has, or does not have, feature X, then Y must be true about the speakers of language A. This claim has been accepted with open arms by the pop science community, as well as other linguistic determinists. Unfortunately for Worf, in 1983, linguist Eckhart Malatke published a study which found that there are hundreds of grammatical structures in the Hopi language that express time. Therefore, the antecedent of Worf's maxim is false, and so is the conclusion. Of course, the Hopi have a sense of time, even if it is expressed in ways not immediately familiar to the Indo-European ear. They don't, and have never had any issue differentiating between the past, present, and future, as Worf's words may have suggested. While this invalidates Worf's Hopi claim, it still leaves the claim of linguistic relativity up in the air. In order to come to a conclusion, let's take a look at the claims and conclusions of the Worfian hypothesis. In John McWhorter's The Language Hoax, Why the World Looks the Same in Any Language, the skeptic lays out a case against the hypothesis. In the book, McWhorter takes a case study into consideration. He looks at the Tuyuka language of the Amazon, which has a plethora of evidential markers, or pieces of words that denote how a speaker knows certain information. Similar to must in the English sentence, they must have seen the tower. That word solely function as an evidential marker in that case. So, McWhorter on page 38 gives us a couple examples of how the Tayu could do it. Those suffixes explain how the speaker knows the information. Given the Tayuka's expansive inventory of evidential markers, a Warpian might be led to conclude that they are more in tune with the sources of their information. Perhaps it is something about living in a rainforest environment that requires them to be more vigilant with their information. 
it begs the question, does having evidential markers in a language make its speakers more sensitive to where the information comes from? Relativists and Warpians alike would likely say yes, but science would disagree with that, according to McWhorter. He cites a University of Delaware study that found that Korean children who learn the evidential markers in their native Korean were, quote, no better than English-speaking children at thinking about sources of information, end quote. Even if we disregard that study, we must consider the broader implications of linking the existence of evidential markers in a language with any traits of its speakers. McWhorter explains that while evidential markers are rare in Europe, they're rather common around the world. But who would venture to say, McWhorter asks, that, quote, the ancient Greeks, who produced some of the world's first philosophical treatises scrupulously examining all propositions, no matter how basic, and lived in a society always under siege from other empires as well as from rival Greeks themselves, were a relatively accepting, unskeptical people with only a modest interest in sources of information, end quote. It would be ludicrous to suggest that due to their lack of evidential markers, Greeks were and are less attuned to the reliability of sources than other groups of people. One might contend in response that Greeks don't have it in their language merely by chance, but the languages that do have it developed it as a result of need. But why then, McWhorter asks, does Bulgarian, a language with evidential markers, have more of a need for them than its neighbors? Surely one would not argue that they have more of a need to be attuned to the veracity of claims than the Polish or the North Macedonians. We can see how, if taken seriously, the Warfian hypothesis leads us to silly conclusions, but they can also be harmful. By congratulating the Tayuka on their evidential markers, we're implicitly applauding the supposed intelligence endowed just by their having them. We are saying that they're more skeptical, thus more intelligent than those without the grammatical feature. While this may be positive if starved of context, we run into issues when we look at who doesn't have evidential markers. For example, they're nearly unheard of in Africa and Polynesia. Thus, by connecting a grammatical feature of a language to a certain cultural or even intellectual concept, we've managed to applaud a group of people while denigrating another. It's after this realization that McWhorter writes that we actually do have a coherent explanation for why we find evidential markers in some languages and not in others. It, quote, is not based on cultural needs. The explanation is, quite simply, chance, end quote. We've examined the shortcomings of Warfianism, but what are its strengths? As we referenced earlier, the softer version of the hypothesis still carries weight today, even in legitimate linguistic circles. You may have heard that the Russian language has two completely different words for what we call light and dark blue. An MIT study set out to determine what, if any advantage, this distinction may have for Russian speakers in identifying different shades of blue. In essence, they wanted to see if having two separate words for light and dark blue affected the thought patterns of Russians. The study found that Russians did indeed discriminate between the colors quicker than English speakers did. Hence the research article's title, Russian Blues Reveal Effects of Language on Color Discrimination. So, isn't this conclusive proof of the superior wharf hypothesis? Doesn't this prove that language affects thought? Well, let's dig a bit deeper. The difference between the English speakers and the Russian speakers was a whopping 124 milliseconds. Far from demonstrating a different worldview, this highly controlled study found minute differences in thought ostensibly due to the language. But that difference should not be construed to mean more than its immediate significance. In this case, the key task for linguists and science-minded people in general is not to confound the findings of this study with the broader maxim that because Russian has different words for what we call light and dark blue, they must see the world fundamentally differently. The former was demonstrated in a highly controlled laboratory setting, and the latter is far from proven. The first version of the wharf sapir hypothesis stands unsupported, while the second has at least a modicum of support. This cartoon shows the silly conclusions of the Warfian hypothesis. Of course, Germans don't have a special need or ability to be more clear about their definiteness of their nouns. Instead, it's just chance that German has so many variations of their definite article. And there's a really interesting linguistic history behind that. And we should explore that history instead of oversimplifying it. 
Perhaps it is the lack of intellectual satisfaction that the answer of chance gives us, which propels us further down rabbit holes of pop science. Even if with good intentions, our belief in incorrect things can lead us down bad paths. For example, Warfianism satisfies a very admirable urge to respect different cultures and languages, but oftentimes it unintentionally insults other cultures, as in the case of evidential markers. We can and very much should respect other cultures, but suggesting language is causative of traits is just not an effective way of doing that. Furthermore, we must accept that chance is a natural part of the development of languages. Languages' traits are not chosen, nor do they engage in natural selection. They are constantly in flux and do not retain some traits and discard others for utility's sake. To reduce them to such is a regrettable simplification of the otherwise fascinating world of linguistics.